Tim Vent. I'm the uh, artistic director here at Lost Station Theater. And we're very proud and honored to uh, be hosting another event for Poem City. And we started doing that last year with the kickoff event and uh, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful program and really proud to support it. Uh, this is what you're seeing here is the uh, emerging set for our first production of our 30th season at City Hall. It's, uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, our, uh, it's called Silent Sky by Lauren Gunderson, a very poetic text, by the way. And uh, Lauren happens to be the most produced playwright in America these days. It will be the first time we've, we've done one of her plays. We really love it, and I think you will too. We have some, our director and our star here in the audience. We keep them under wraps for now. Uh, it is my pleasure to get things started tonight by introducing the man who is at the head of the organization that makes Poem City happen, this amazing explosion in the spring that we now enjoy statewide and even beyond. Now, Tom McCone, Kella Covered Library. Okay. Thank you, Kim. Uh, and thank you very much to Lost Nation Theater, to Kathleen Keenan, Kim Dent, uh, for being part of Poem City, for uh, co-hosting, uh, co-sponsoring this event with us tonight. Without, and, uh, and Kim, I do have my season tickets, as you probably already know, so I'll be here <laughs> for the opening play. The, um, but without Lost Nation Theater and other organizations and businesses and individuals, we wouldn't be able to do Poem City the way we do it, because this is really, it's the largest project that the library does. It, it requires an enormous amount of time. Um, lots and lots of people work on it. So the uh, support we get, and the grants, and the in-kind contributions, and the donations, and the volunteer labor are all essential to making this, um, making this work. I'd like to mention our five primary uh, financial sponsors. Vermont Humanities Council, and the Vermont College of Fine Arts, Hunger Mountain Co-op, National, uh, National Light, Light Group Foundation, and this year, for the first year, the Poetry Society of Vermont. I think that really <laughs> We are always indebted to the communities of Berlin, Calais, East Montpelier, Middlesex, Montpelier, and Worcester, for their annual support on town meeting day. We're an independent nonprofit organization, but we really depend very heavily on the six communities that contribute to keeping us alive and keeping us thriving. So, and also, there are far too many people to ask to be able to thank people individually, because so many people contribute to this. The, uh, our presenters, um, if, any, if you saw the article in the week, it was an article about how poets can't make a living. Um, we knew that already, but they gave us some, ex they gave us some uh, specific examples. And they were talking about how you know, presenters get really modest um, stipends for participating in this process. And we appreciate that, because we have people we know in different contexts actually get a you know, fair amount of money for uh, doing a presentation. And then we give them a couple bucks. But anyway, so we appreciate that. And, and, and many of our presenters actually um, just volunteer their time. So it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful for us. The many people who write poems and contribute poems make that happen, too, because we have hundreds of poems posted throughout the city, which is such a, such a delight to have. Um, oh, there is one person I could mention, because we have uh, of the, the coordinators in this effort with dozens and dozens of people, it takes a Poem City coordinator. Would you please thank Rachel Sennett. <laughs> Rachel is one of the people who started this, came up with this idea nine years ago, and has kept it going ever since then. Uh, we think this is the first time. So tonight, we have the Poets Laureate. Right, Mary? <laughs> it's not the Poet Laureates, and I'm sorry that we wrote Poet Laureates in a few places. It is, we have Poets Laureate from Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine. 
we know it's the first time these three particular poets have read together. And we also think it's the first time that poet laureates from the three states have read together. And this is uh, kind of adds to making this a special event. So, so we have, in a moment, I'm going to introduce Char Dignard, the Vermont poet laureate. Laureate, laureate, sorry. And then he's going to introduce, introduce Alice Fogel, the poet laureate from New Hampshire, and Stuart Kestenbaum, poet laureate of Maine. So Shard, to start things backwards, uh, lives in Westminster West with his wonderful wife, Liz. We had a debate whether we should talk about Liz or Shard, but Liz. He, he thought he should talk about Liz. So in uh, 2002, he was the co-founder of New England College MFA program in poetry, and he directed that program for five years. He's currently a professor of English at Providence College. He has at least six books that I'm aware of, mostly poetry, some essays, and his most recent book is Interesting. And uh, before I turn it over to him, I'm going to read to him, I'm going to read a couple comments from other poets, what they have to say about him. So Peter Campion says, very few contemporary poets render as uniquely as Shard Dinoir does the sheer wonder of being. Our world shines up from his lines and sentences with all its original splendor and strangeness. In Dinoir's spectacular gaze, old binaries of reality and dream, bitterness and love, joke and revelation fuse into a beautiful whole. Dinoir is a visionary. And a couple lines from the, uh, I think, Ukrainian-American poet, um, Ilya Kaminsky. The voice in these poems seems to have a cunning ability to see oneself as if from a distance. This is compelling, beautiful poetry. So tonight, we're fortunate we don't need to appreciate Shard from a distance, because he's right here. Would you please welcome Shard <laughs> Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Austin Nation Theater. Thank all of you who've come out. Thank you for the entire community of Montpelier. I don't know of another town in the country where there are poems in the windows like this, where um, there are, um, I like to think of the poems as windows also, the windows to another world life. Uh, so windows on the windows. Um, <clears throat> Um, it gives me great uh, pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Stu Kastenbaum and Alice Vogel uh, to you also tonight. So th this is a, a wonderful occasion, um, a celebration of poetry and, and poets, and I hope and I hope this continues. Um, you know, there's that famous saying by uh, uh, the lines by William Carlos Williams: "It's difficult to get the news from poetry." <laughs> it's difficult to get the news from poetry. You know, uh, Williams was a doctor in the Rutherford and Patterson, New Jersey, and um, uh, practiced uh, poetry at the same time that he practiced medicine. So he was immersed in the world um, and, um, in, and um, people's illnesses and writing poetry at the same time. So he, he, he had a wonderfully realistic view towards the real world and uh, language that stays new. So he said, it's difficult to get the news from poetry. But people die every day from the lack of what's found there. Um, so he was speaking uh, spiritually there as, um, as a man who was also integrally, organically connected to the body as well. Um, so I hope that tonight you'll hear poetry that uh, contains news, that stays news, that you get, and uh, if you don't, you can, I'm sure, talk to us afterwards, and we'll, we'll try our best to talk a little bit about um, uh, our poetry. I'm going to introduce um, Stuart uh, Kastenbaum to you first, um, and then Alice Vogel. Stuart is the main poet laureate. He's the author of four collections of poems, Pilgrimage, House of Thanksgiving, Prayers and Run-On Sentences, and only now, and a collection of essays, The View From Here. He has written and spoken widely on craft making and creativity, 
His poems in writing have appeared in numerous small press publications and magazines, including Tacoon, The Sun, Beloit Poetry Journal, Northeast Corridor, and others in on Garrison Keillor's Writer's Almanac. He was appointed the Poet Laureate in May of Maine in 2016. Former U.S. Poet Laureate Ted Couser has written, Stuart Kastenbaum writes the kind of poems I love to read, heartfelt responses to the privilege of having been given a life. No hidden agendas here, no theories to espouse, nothing but life, pure life, set down with craft and love. He was the editor of the Haystack, he was the director of the Haystack Mountain School of Crafts in Deer Island, Maine for 27 years, where he established innovative programs combining craft and writing and craft and new technologies. He's an honorary fellow of the American Craft Council and recipient of the Distinguished Educators Award from the James Renwick Alliance. And it gives me great pleasure and honor to introduce him to you. Welcome him, welcome him here. You know, we didn't know what order we were going in, now I know. <laughs> I think it's a good sign if your first speaker takes his or her watch off, and takes a look at it before they get started. <laughs> hey, it's not working. <laughs> the water is from Maine, it's Poland spring water. <laughs> but I bought it in Vermont on the other side of the river. <laughs> Do you know when uh, we were in, uh, this is an amazing city. I feel like this was the place I imagined what life was going to be like in the future and wasn't. <laughs> and, and here I am, and, it, and it's like that. But we were waiting in the, uh, I was picking out the poems I was going to read tonight. We were in the uh, parking lot behind the hotel we stayed in last night, and there was a car with its alarm going off. Like, non probably 15, 20 minutes stop, and honk, honk, honk. And I thought maybe that's the only urban part of Montpelier. You need to have one honker, like a designated honker. It, I believe it was a Subaru, too. Just, just a hunch. Um, well, I, I guess I'll, I'll start with a, a prayer. You know, it was, it's April, and we drove, through, we drove through a snowstorm to get here from Maine. April prayer. Just before the green begins, there is a hint of green, a blush of color, and the red buds thicken the ends of the maple's branches, and everything is poised before the start of a new world which is really the same world, just moving forward from bud to flower to blossom to fruit to harvest to sweet sleep. And the roots await the next signal, every signal, every call a miracle. And the switchboard is lighting up, and the operators are standing by in the pledge drive we've all been listening to. Go make the call. <laughs> um, you know, there are a couple of things that join uh, Maine and New Hampshire and Vermont together, and, and one of them, I, I believe, is uh, Subarus. <laughs> but I think, you know, I've thought about the difference between poetry and advertising, because they both use uh, language to get you to do something. Well, poetry doesn't want you to do something, but it uses language in a way that makes you take notice. And advertising can do the same thing. But and much as I love my Subaru, when they have a slogan that says love, it's what makes a Subaru a Subaru, you think, not really. As love has nothing to do with this car. You know? uh, and that's the difference, I think, between advertising and poetry, in case you were wondering. So, uh, this is a, a kind of a confessional poem, uh, and it's the end of winter. Starting the Subaru at five below. After six main winters and 100,000 miles, when I take it to be inspected, I search for gas stations where they just say beep the horn and don't ask me to put it on the lift, exposing its soft, rusted underbelly. Inside is the record of commuting, apple cores, a bag for McDonald's, crushed Dunkin' Donuts cups, a flashlight that doesn't work and one that does, gas receipts blurred beyond recognition. Fingertips numb, nose hair frozen, I pump the accelerator and turn the key. The battery cranks, the engine gives two or three low groans and starts, my God, it starts. And unlike my family in the house, the job I'm headed towards, the poems in my briefcase, the dreams I had last night, there is no question about what makes sense. 
wet exhaust billowing from the tailpipe, heater blowing, this car is going to move me. It's going to take me places. <laughs> well, while I'm on the Subaru kick, and, uh, you know, I apologize in advance now that I'm in Vermont for having mentioned McDonald's <laughs> and also uh, Dunkin' Donuts, but I don't go to McDonald's anymore, but I used to get like a, like two large orders of french fries just to stay awake, and then they would fall, they fall, they get on the mat, and then you look at them afterwards, and it's, uh, and uh, with the Dunkin' Donuts, I find uh, it's just a good way to stay awake. If you just get coffee, you have to fuss with it while you're driving. So I still stop there. And I did find a funny sign when I was drying my hands yesterday, and it said, Dunkin' Donuts cares about the environment. That's why they have the hand dryer, the heat one. But they serve, like, millions of styrofoam cups. So I guess it's a different division that cares about the environment. So this is when I was... Uh, I just wanted to stay awake, so I stopped at Dunkin' Donuts, and I uh, uh, got a donut and coffee, and then I drove off in the dark, and I bit into the donut, and there was an earring back. It was oh. really oh. Gro It's really gross. And, uh, <laughs> but you know, when you're having something that gross happen to you, you don't actually think it's really gross. You just go... Uh, anyhow, that's, that was the genesis, of, the genesis of this poem. I thought that perhaps at that moment they knew that I was... Uh, director of a, a school of crafts, Haystack, and this was, maybe it was an MFA degree. Put me in a thesis project, like, can you eat what you wear? You know, you say, okay. Rocky Coast. First, there was the pink granite, molten and buried for 350 million years. Then there was the ice encountering the ledge, dragging rocks and trees over the land. And then the lichen working in the cold, ceaseless wind cleaving to the stone, resurrecting the soil by eating away at the mica and quartz to make a thin layer of earth that the coast rests on. And then there was the Dunkin' Donuts, built on the ledge in 1989 in Bucksport, Maine, the town where the paper mill makes clouds and sends them billowing out into the landscape. The Dunkin' Donuts, where the coffee is always fresh, and when you inhale its aroma, it's as if you were starting the day again or starting your life over. One more chance. This is where I buy my chocolate sugar donut and drive down Route 15 in the dark when I bite down on an earring back baked into it. I dream of the million dollar liability settlement, enough to do whatever I would want to, and return to show with horror the small steel post to the young woman in bright polyester at the counter who offers me a dozen free donuts. Not enough to change my life, but enough to feed me for a while. And what else could you need? Sugar, fat, and the first bite, like Eve's, just before she walked out into the fallen world. <laughs> when, when I brought those back, actually, um, she was not horrified at all. And, <laughs> and she said, she said, oh yeah, they bake those in Bangor. Like, <laughs> like if that was enough. <clears throat> well, I've lived in the, in New England for a long time and, and uh, uh, rooted for the uh, Red Sox, but but I'm actually grew up a Yankee fan, so I've, I've actually been um, torn between the two teams. And so now I'm like a man without a religion or a country. I've, I've gone back and forth and now I have, I'm, I'm kind of homeless in terms of baseball. But this, uh, but baseball figures into this poem back when I was young and I could do anything and was a Yankee fan. Fresh cut grass. This is where my great career as a second baseman will begin, between the rhododendron that makes a hiding place next to the brick wall of our home and the sloping yard rolling downhill to the slate sidewalk. On the far end, the big silver maple that once guarded the old house of our ancient neighbor who died there, and close by, the curb with the storm sewer where all balls eventually find their way. <laughs> my glove is ready, the stand usual four-fingered model that I have prepped over the winter the way my big brother does, oiled with a ball in place and a belt fastened around it to make the perfect pocket. I'm ready for the game. I want to wear this glove to break it in so that the leather, leather will be blackened and shiny and I will catch everything, the short hop, hard grounders and line drives. That I am skinny and left-handed may be a drawback for my prospects of being an infielder for the Yankees, 
but it's not stopping me now. I throw the ball in the air, I run under it, calling up all the, my imaginary teammates. It's rising in the sky, in this stadium, this white planet of possibility I'm searching for in the vast blue sky. So I live on Deer Isle, which is approximately 100 hours from here. No, no, it's not that far. It's uh, six hours from here. Do you know that you can, that Maine is as large as all the other New England states combined? And do you know it tries to pave all those roads? But in Vermont, they know not to. <laughs> Smart idea. But you can get, you could actually just slide off a of Vermont road this time of year, right? Or, yeah. yeah. You can slide off the main road, but I think it has to be speed induced, perhaps. But I think about uh, all the farmland. I mean, anytime you see a stone wall in the woods, you know that that was a farm. And you think, I think about what it took to make a farm, to make a life there, and what it's like to have that go by. And uh, um, where we live, the, uh, one of the, and the orchardist on the island knew all the trees all over the island. So if you said you want to make cider, you pick cider, you can go to pick apples, you can go to, to where Lloyd lived. And he would say, oh, yeah. Now, if you go down uh, just past this house, take a right past where so and so used to live, there are three uh, king trees that have king apples there. That's where you should go. So he, he would know, like it was knowing a family. And just made me think about all that local knowledge and what we know and don't know anymore. Cider. Lloyd knows all the trees on the island, the ones that were overgrown, but were once pruned and picked for pies and cider, baking and eating. The ones with the forgotten names, Gravenstein, Northern Spy, Jonathan, and the histories of the hard scrabble homesteads they grew on. Every year they were touched by someone's hands in the fields and yards where delicate blossoms come early in the sudden New England spring. He guides us to the crossroad near the cemetery back by the shed, once used for chickens and now used for nothing. Close by are the second growth spruce where in early winter deer will leap out to eat the fallen fruit. But now we are the ones who crouch in the tall grass of autumn's fertility and decay and pick the drops, the huge red kings, an apple almost gone from memory, nearly two bushels from one tree that we add to our mix of Macintosh and Golden Delicious. In the colder afternoon air, Lloyd cranks the press down with an iron bar, turning pulp into cider as yellow jackets swarm and stumble around us, celebrating the old sweetness as it goes by. A few years ago, uh, I was invited to be a visiting writer at a school called Penland. It's a craft school. It's uh, similar to Haystack. It's in North Carolina. And uh, it was really great because I had just left my position at Haystack where I had to worry about potential disaster and wonderful educational experiences, you know, for many years. So to go someplace where you just had to watch it happen it was very therapeutic. And, uh, and at Haystack, I used to read poetry to people before a session would begin. It was a way of, you know, if you have a chance to read poems to people who don't expect it, and they're not afraid that they weren't going to get it, and they didn't know it was going to happen, and they hear it, and they aren't hurt by it, then you've made a convert of sorts. So, uh, and when I got to Penland, one of the teachers had been to Haystack and said, oh, you know, you should come read us a poem before we start our workshop. And I did, and then uh, he said, his name is Bob Evendorf, he said, oh, Stuart's like a, like a tinker, because he comes here and reads poems. And I said, well, if I were a tinker, you'd actually give me your broken things, and I'd mend them. So why don't you give me words, and I'll make them into poems. So that started a whole series that's the basis of a new manuscript I'm working on. Uh, so it's a kind of form. Like, I figure it's not my fault if it doesn't work out because they weren't my words. <laughs> but it's also like a word like I never would use uh, in uh, a poem, like serendipity would not be a word that would occur to me to use in a poem. So I'll, I'll let you know the words. I don't think you need to know them, but, uh, but it'll give you a sense of, of what I was dealing with. And this one, the words I was given were pinhole camera, sharks, deteriorating, evergreen, Silky, sleep, cement, rose, serendipity, flight, moonbeam, gawk, thistle, satisfaction, worth, and conflagration. And uh, I wrote this before the, the election in 2016, but I think I was, I must have been channeling something. How to start over. 
We knew that things were deteriorating, Gothic houses collapsing, sharks patrolling the lagoons, the born-again ministers warning of an immediate conflagration. All the flights to paradise had been canceled, and even pinhole cameras weren't letting light in. It got to be so bad, we didn't want to listen to the news anymore, where all we were doing was gawking at someone else's trouble. It wasn't worth the effort. Where was the satisfaction we longed for? We couldn't sleep, so we'd spend all night watching the full moon's beams cement themselves to the silky water and travel for miles on the waves. Someone was rowing along the shore, and in the silver light, the evergreens were shaking slightly. At the edge of the forest, the thistles were attaching themselves to the fur of animals. What serendipity to hitch a ride to your future. <laughs> and uh, this, uh, this poem, the words I was given are marsupial mountain basket cleft, immensely bacon pattern noodle, anxiety rigor mortis, stoicism, applesauce, stressed passion silhouette, and bedfellows. <laughs> so after I got back from Penland, I wrote to people I knew and just said, send me words. And, and two of them taught at MIT, so I really got an odd, you know, <laughs> like somebody said, I always wanted to have somebody use the word thixotropic in a poem. <laughs> <laughs> me too. So, <clears throat> Hermit's Dream. Living on the mountaintop, I missed coffee and bacon at first. Who doesn't? And later began to dream of simple things, like applesauce and noodles, since I was living on air. Passion takes many forms, my master had always stressed. Look for patterns, he said. Being and non-being are strange bedfellows. One day, anxiety left, drifting off and settling in a rock cleft far below. When the light was right, I could watch its silhouette moving wildly. I learned the names of my fears and put them in a basket. Each day, I would climb up the ledges, remembering who I had been, feeling like a marsupial carrying all those personalities in my pouch. Then there was nothing but it's not what we fear, no rigor mortis. I was alive and dancing in this immense nothing that is everything. Stoics were laughing, birds were singing, first morning. <laughs> then I was teaching, a, in Maine there's a, a medical humanities program where uh, physicians and healthcare providers can, can read uh, different books and they read a book of my poems and then they, uh, I was talking to the person who was leading it and I told her about the series I was doing so they all sent me words before I got there and I read a poem poem. It's not like a poem while you wait but it, it's called uh, Evening Song and uh, these words were uh, Melody Vicissitudes, which is a word I would never, ever think of using. <laughs> Vicissitudes, weevil, laugh, deceit, betrothed, burden, salubrious, peepers, and caterwaul. <laughs> Evening song. At first, you can't hear the melody, your mind being too busy replaying the vicissitudes of every day with its petty deceits. Does it feel that you are betrothed to a burden? Toward evening, you walk into your field to see the larvae of weevils ready to burrow into everything you've planted. Time to blame someone else, caterwaul against confusion. And then you hear them, the spring peepers in the pond, emerging from some salubrious laboratory of life to sing, if not a hymn of happiness, then at least a raucous tune made of water and light. Why not laugh? How much more do you need? I'll, I'll read you uh, three more poems. One is three pages. <laughs> um, this one uh, is called, the words I used were, uh, sliver dog evoke marriage quality, pizza emulate Newtonian, swim cupcake delirium and loose leaf. You know, the thing, if you start out with that, like what, it's actually quite freeing because, like, what could go right? <laughs> you know? So you just, you just have to jump in. So I think in a way it became like a way of, you know, for me to jump in. Uh, and then I started this by making a decree. It's called decree. Uh, so, you know, like in the Bible, you know, it starts out, you know, uh, let there be light. 
but like then all of a sudden you're on a roll because you're, you're making the world, right? So, <laughs> decree. Let there be equality in every marriage, and let love emulate Newtonian physics, falling down to earth from the heavens, so that we will understand that a pound of love drops at the same rate as a pound of iron or a pound of feathers. Only when love lands, it breaks into slivers of hope. Let the dogs roll in the shards and begin to trot deliriously in search of pizza crusts and cupcake wrappers and swim to the land of dead things to roll in, for hope is eternal in all our hearts, animals, and humans alike. And while we're at it, let's gather up the love and put it in loose leaf binders and page through what was, that was become is, let our hearts learn to be. And uh, this poem, the words I used were memory, money-making, logarithmic, time, smoking, unseen, perfection, discovery, flow, travel, scent, growth, talking, passing, intimacy, tangled, serve, recovery, collecting, and Oprah. <laughs> you get all done, you go, got it, and then you see Oprah, and you think, oh. <laughs> Discovering fame. Back when there were stage doors, you were standing outside one in the alley, smoking a last cigarette, waiting to appear on Oprah. The smoke flowed through your body, and you exhaled the perfect O's, which traveled down the narrow space between the brick walls. You were passing time, wondering what the two of you would be talking about, what she could possibly want to know about your tangled, unseen life, the intimacy of recovery, or the scent of the money that you were making. Remember that day? You were collecting yourself, waiting to serve up your memories before a national TV audience, making logarithmic calculations about your soul's journey into the bright lights. And the last poem I'm going to read uh, grew out of, uh, when, when I was at Haystack, uh, people would often give me uh, artwork. to I could use it as a prompt work that they'd made. I would look at it, I'd write something. And, and a, a glass blower, Kate Rhodes, wanted me to write a catalog essay for her that was a poem. So she sent me a piece of hers, which was uh, uh, kind of glass baskets that were made of marini, which are glass strands that are pulled and cut. So you have long, long tubes of glass, and then they were stitched together. Not that you'd have to know that for this, but it, so it's kind of a very airy structure. And uh, that's it. Holding the light. Gather up whatever is glittering in the gutter, whatever has tumbled in the waves or fallen in flames out of the sky. For it's not only our hearts that are broken, but the heart of the world as well. Stitch it back together. Make a place where the day speaks to the night and the earth speaks to the sky. Whether we created God or God created us, it all comes down to this. In our imperfect world, we are meant to repair and stitch together what beauty there is. Stitch it with compassion and wire. See how everything we have made gathers the light inside itself and overflows a blessing. Thank you. Thank you, Stu. So it gives me great pleasure also to introduce Alice Fogel to you who is the Poet Laureate of New Hampshire. Originally from Hudson Valley, she's the former theatrical customer who earned her BA in Art and Literature from Antioch College and her MA in Poetry from the University of New Hampshire. In addition to Strange Terrain, a guide to appreciating poetry without necessarily getting it, <laughs> she's the author of five poetry collections, including Be That Empty in 2007, Interval, poems based on, upon Bach's Goldberg Variations, an amazing book, which won the Nicholas Schaffner Award for Music and Literature, and The Doubtful House in 2017, a brand new book. She's been an eight-time Pushcart nominee, and her poems appear in many journals and anthologies, including The Best American Poetry and Robert Hass's column, Poet's Choice. Fogel has been a fellow at the Carl Sandburg National Historic Site and a recipient of the National Endowment for the Arts uh, Individual Artist Fellowship, 
among other awards. She's been a reader or judge for numerous programs or publications, including Alice James Books and the Maine Arts Council Writing Grants, uh, Bohan Publishing, and Zoki Quazal Artist Residency. I think I just um, botched that pronunciation pretty bad. Uh, she travels around giving talks and workshops for all ages on both reading and writing throughout New Hampshire um, and for the New Hampshire Councils on the Arts and Humanities. Uh, she works one-on-one uh, with, uh, -on -one with learning disabled students at Landmark College in Putney, Vermont. Um, I, over and over uh, again, am, am uh, stunned and um, um, drawn to Alice's deaf treatment of language in her poems. Uh, these lines from her poem, no less, um, I think, um, summarize in a way that serves as a kind of um, ars poetica, how she works, how she views the world. Sometimes the smallest things weigh us down, small stones that we can't help admiring and palming. Look at the tiny way this lighter vein got inside. Look at the heavy gray dome of its sky. I'm going to end there. The rest of the poem is just as good. Palace. Thanks, Chard. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out. Thank you to our hosts and this really interesting site that we get to read in. Um, I definitely could connect with what Stuart was saying, was saying about um, getting a supply of words to write from. I do this to myself all the time. I make up rules as I write, and so I often will just grab my um, favorite CD of the moment and look at the song titles and the album titles and just make myself use all those words in whatever I'm writing at the time. Um, so I was writing, working on this poem that I'm going to read first, which is about skateboarding and octopuses. And um, Pat Fargnoli, who was a previous New Hampshire Poet Laureate, got in touch with me and said, I'm doing an anthology on poems about ice cream. You got any? And I said, no, but I will tomorrow. <laughs> so um, I added ice cream in to this. Um, it's called Choices. And it includes several words and phrases stolen from the poet William Stafford. You and your metaphysical skateboard, are you encouraging good fortune in your own little ways? How do you act to make things right when you swerve every which way to avoid those obstacles only you find in the otherwise empty park? Lucky you, you believe you can keep things by not having them, and by wheeling around putting them down in ink. In the kitchen of your psyche, the freezer is full of ice cream, a dozen glorious flavors, and none edible, because not one of them is all of them. Take heart, or never mind. Alternatively, try thinking of amnesia as a form of revision, a lapsed paralysis, a stance. Can we make good choices if we can't even trust the world we navigate with our own senses? Is it more heroic to be like the octopus, flipping colors depending on your arc, veering in eight directions all at the same time? Poems also come out of um, things that I'm reading at the time, and um, uh, the, that uh, residency that I judged for, the Soshi Ketsal one, um, the writer that we allowed to um, be there for free this past winter um, was a Scottish writer called Malachi Tellick. And he had this really great book that I discovered about um, I think it was called the Undiscovered Islands. Undiscovered meaning that they were islands that were on maps for sometimes for centuries and sometimes until very recently that never existed. <laughs> it's a really fun book. And it's also very highly illustrated. So um, I had islands on my mind and thought I would write this 
poem about exploration and believing in finding and or arrival, the island. Sailor, set a course in search of a bed to lie in, an inhabited island appearing as if in a myth about the treasure you're about the treasure awaiting the pure of heart, a heaven for the blessed or for the only now awakened. You will find it as it appears through heavy fog or before the rising sun at midnight. No one knows its coordinates or how it got precisely here of all the points and patterns on the ocean. Longitude of where and latitude of when, without recourse to predict whether it will exist the next time you approach it. This island may be unseen from a distance, may hover just beyond the risk of running aground on rocks. It's dangerous to misread stars, to triangulate by the damp and rusted instruments you carry. But forgo codes of confluence. Try the compass of coincidence. Sailor, disorient yourself. Open your map of mirage, your map of immersion. Although the names may change, always the cartographers love claiming an island to be true until it's proven imaginary. They draw it in, unquestioning, century after century, and explorers note in fine letters the floating city, its gardens, its gold. Step on ground as if it's there, as onto a lifeboat. Pull around you the good fortune of finding a phantom blanket afloat on the sea. Why shouldn't you seek such a tempting destination, such a sweet figment of shore? There the ripest mangoes sway, within reach from trees. Foxes and deer watch, long feathers sweep past on wings. Be dazzling fish weave in the fresh water. Wherever you are, Moonlight stretches over the waves into your arms. I worked on um, several books that had themes. I, um, as Chard mentioned, I wrote a book of poems based on Box Goldberg variations, and then I also wrote a collection of poems that hasn't come out yet um, based on um, abstract expressionist art. Um, and we'll talk a little bit of, more about that later. But recently, in, in recent years, um, I've just been trying to write poems, not um, I felt like I was having a crutch. It was a crutch for me to um, have all these other inspirations that were always there for me to plug an idea into. So I've just been allowing myself to be influenced by separate things. So um, I was working with a student recently on Camus' interpretation of the Sisyphus myth, as some of you might be familiar with. And so um, the idea of um, the Sisyphus story, the carrying up the hill of this rock that you have to continue to, you know, every day do it again and again. I decided to try to think of that in a more positive way. <laughs> <clears throat> and I decided that's what love is. It's called then again. What if to love is to be swept apart by love's own flung distances? and rejoined by its drenching climbs, each falling between falling and mastering the repetitive task of raising it back up to heights so it might fall again, all of it lit and sundered into what can't be illumined, love lifted and then lost time after time 
coming briefly to rest at the bottom, the unbearable body of it, a kind of seal that breaks away as if forever, but not forever, and rises elsewhere. And then again, love moving as two seals, their weight, their density, the massive steeping of their wet bodies pouring over each other, coming apart, each oceanic, each mountainous, simultaneously sweat-salted and sweet, solid and slippery. What if light on the surface fell and threw shadow down? Light on the sea limited itself by depths. Light on the rock made the rock light. All of it at once, love, the rock yearning to be free, to fall back alone, to rest, the arms aching to let it go, and the rock yearning to be carried again, the arms aching to hold the heaviness of the burden. You may have heard that scientists have been able to stop light from moving and trap it inside of a quartz rock. This actually has happened. It can be inscribed and then sent along on its way. It has all sorts of useful applications, I'm sure, probably having to do with um, internet use. Um, so I'm really interested in um, science that often inspires me. I'm also working on a project right now um, in New Hampshire with New Hampshire women artists and poets who I've, we've paired each other up. Every poet gets an artist and we're working on these um, collaborations. So my artist, Mary Cornog, has um, done a painting and this is my poem that um, I wrote in response to the painting, which looks to me like um, rain on an ocean with layers, multiple horizons. It's called distance. A bow strikes sound from strings, the way the horizon weaves through a steady rain. Distance hinges on distance. Clouds can cool to near absolute zero. You don't have to see what you've done to have done it, or what comes first, farther or farther still. Water thrums on water, string on string, skin when the wind's fingers play on me. The mind can change while all else remains the same. What did I think I wanted to know? Or what did I wish had been different? In a lab, scientists slowed light speed to that of the wheels of a bike, then stopped it, held it, let it go again. How it fit inside a crystal made transparent as a breath that might travel far, with its new message might streak across night air to where the sun hasn't met its catena yet. Whether time went on passing while the light filled the stone, obscured again, while a melody paused between chords, resonant, massless, a vacuum, it stayed still, trapped, apart, when it was released, a wave vibrates here in between the spokes that I hadn't been imprinted like a beam of light and sent sputtering over thresholds in the strokes of storms. I'm not going to say anything to introduce this one. I think it will just become apparent. It's called On What We Can Do Before It's Too Late. 
How can we cross a field, dewless from a long and cloudless day, if we have not yet entered the field or the day? Still in the woods, I try to imagine the field ahead, its flush of birds from brittle grasses, its fading wilt of wildflowers, iris, daisy, lace, and try to taste the last heat in my throat as I walk through the piercing tinnitus of cicadas. I want the field to be so real, I feel the sharp embedding of insects' teeth in my wrist. I want to know the field before it exists, or not at all, because my father will die, and until then, what can I do before it is too late? Only walk beside him and hold his hand, which has a particular feel, dry with a kind of river inside it, and always has, while in his particular way, he holds mine. Where is the field between the forests of imagine and know? Where is the field I will be crossing when I walk alone beside him, without him, only remembering his hand? So I am often inspired by um, by art, and I particularly love um, what abstract expressionist painters do, like Gerhard Richter and Liz de Nord, um, who layer paint onto a canvas and scrape it and add more and scrape it and add more, and it, it keeps on changing. And each time it is something, and it's beautiful, um, but more and more happens, and there's these layers. And um, I thought, maybe I'd try to write a poem that did that somehow. So um, this poem has three parts, and um, it starts with the sparest lines of words, um, which hopefully say something. <laughs> and then each, each new poem takes those same words in the same order and the same lines, but adds more to each line, more words to each one. Um, and each time, it changes, the meaning changes somewhat. Um, I've been really obsessed with fringes. I really like how fringes are kind of part solid and part air. And um, I've been writing poems that have these lines that are not consistent. Some of them are long and some of them are short, so they look kind of fringy. Um, and so this poem is called The Fringe. I'm not going to say the numbers. I'll just pause between the three parts the fringe. A set of peers, a perspective, a delta, fastened to one edge and stretching to air, part free while attached, spills, strains, shapes, rivers, branches. I want loose open fingers, not the fist, and the shore, I want the fjord. Give me my own momentum. I can move. A set of peers affords a fluid perspective, a delta. Its slivers fasten to one edge and stretching to a multitude, part air, part free while attached. It spills through blue, strains the shapes that take rivers, cleaving branches, dividing. I want loose, open fingers, not the fist, the wish and the weight held me. Sure, I want the fjord. Give me a boat and my boots by my own momentum. I can move what I have to. The fringe is a set of peers that affords a fluid perspective, is a delta. 
its anchored slivers fastened to land at one edge and stretching away to a multitude of finite elsewheres, part air, part solid, part free while attached, attenuated, it curves and spills its silk through blue depths, green, strains the impermanent shapes that take form, rivers cleaving cliffs, branches dividing sky, and I just want this grief let loose between its open fingers, not the fist that was the wish and the waiting that held me to the unsure. I want the rift and range of fjord. Give me a boat and hand me my boots. I can take both land and sea by my own momentum. I can reach the points of opposing truths. Inhale, exhale, move, and do what I have to do. This will be my last one. Um, sometimes people ask me um, how long it takes me to use an idea that I get or an image or something, and sometimes it happens that day or it happens soon. Um, one time, I think I was in uh, middle school, I was in eighth grade, I had this really great social studies teacher, and he was reading the New York Times every day back when the ink was really smeary, so you could tell it was in his class because all day long you'd see who had the black smears all over our faces and our fingers. Um, and there were these little fillers um, that I found really fascinating. And one of the fillers, this is like way back before we knew what homeless people were, we didn't have that word yet. There was a filler about um, a man who was found dead in the bleachers after a baseball game. And he was wearing his bedroom slippers. That was all it said. I cut it out and I taped it into my diary. And about 30 years later, I wrote a poem about it. Um, but this one is even longer, even a longer story. So uh, this time I was in high school. Um, and back in those days, FM radio was new. And you could um, listen to the, the, um, the DJs would go on sometimes for half an hour telling a story. And you could just get completely wrapped up in it and drop everything. And just sit there in your room listening to these stories. And so um, that's what happened this one particular night. Um, this DJ told a story about uh, some place in the world where when people died, they did this thing, which I'm not going to tell you because it's in the poem. <laughs> um, and I just was so mesmerized by it. And I just finally put it in a poem really recently. So that's probably my longest. Let's see, that would be like about 40 something years. So you just never know what's going to come to fruition ever. This is called Beautiful. What if what you had will be from a distance clear, though it had been up close, indecipherable? It could end the day before tomorrow, and not yet right, not enough. Even then, will you admit it, how it might be like the moment before you say a name you don't remember until that moment? Like when the chance meeting meant love, when the dying becomes sure death? As if there were no difference Will you know, finally, will you want, perhaps, everything? Wish that when you'd wish someone would do what someone wished you would do, you had done it? You know you do want to have made something that beautiful. What if you're never forced to form it mid-sentence, mid-life, and you are not ready when you do slip into the cool hole you dug. Hand me down my flute, you could say, reaching up, though you've never played the flute. Then alone, in those last days, with your heart emptying, you play 
for your life. Son Wilder, his name is, and he's from Maine. He's from Portland. And he's a little bit of a rebel. He's going to read a poem about it, but it slipped under the. It's just like Wilder, it just slipped right under the seats over there. So I don't know if I'm going to be able to read. It's right under there. It's okay. <laughs> I'll read it again sometime. Um, it's about picking potato, digging potatoes with him. Um, so I'm going to um, start with a poem called um, The Beavers. So, is there a lot of beaver ponds around here? Yeah. yeah. We have beaver ponds uh, all over the place in southern Vermont, and um, the farmers despise them, most of them, and try to blow them up shoot the beavers, including our neighbors. So I wrote a poem about this, trying not to make it sound too much like Mending Wall. <laughs> the old stone savage armed. They flooded the pasture, my neighbor explained, when we met this morning at the property line that divides the field from mine, which is also a meadow. Although I call it a pasture, I'm talking to him since a meadow is not a place his cows would roam but a patch of paradise for picnics and lovers. We'd just been walking around to see what damage winter had done to the fence and trees when we met at the marker and greeted each other, then broached the weather and other things regarding spring, the sap, the grade, its run, the snow, the herd, the beavers. They're heading this way as we speak, he said. I saw them in a dream last night. Spirits, I thought, come back to teach the mysteries of building houses in water, but nodded instead like a dashboard doll. Elders in the ruse of beavers with a genius for damning, I wanted to tell him, but couldn't stop nodding in agreement with, its, with his denial of the fun he has each summer exploding their houses with TNT then shooting them from behind a wall. Pests, he called them, when he really meant such perfect moving targets for catching in the hairs of his 243. Good luck, I said in a tone he didn't catch as I continued down the row of giant maples to the stream of them, to the stream, to see if I could find some sign of them as I had in previous years, the prints of little hands in the loam and eaten trees, but nothing yet. Just the cold, dark water of Sackett's Brook beneath the silence of a cloudless sky, where a red-tailed hawk, besieged by sparrows, let out a cry, and then another. Um, go read. This one next, it's called Giving Ruth Up. Uh, when Ruth Stone, who was the poet laureate of Vermont from 19, uh, 19 uh, 2000, um, I think uh, 8 to 2012, something like that. Um, she was in bed most of the time because she was 94, 95. And um, she was just tired and she'd done her work. And so she, she just had the greatest time. She's just, just a fantastic poet, a national treasure. We never went to college and just found her, her poetry um, within herself and, and from her incredible experience of raising three daughters without a husband and living in Goshen without any potable water. I don't know how she did it. At any rate, she just loved listening to P.G. Woodhouse in bed and laughing all day. <laughs> for five months I tried to get Ruth out of bed to sit in her chair and maybe stand for a while. No, she said. I don't have the strength anymore in my legs. And besides, I'm blind. 
But I had, I had read her poems and knew how truthful she was as a liar, and so continued to urge her to rise like the paralytic from his pallet and walk, at least sit up, and move around before her muscles quit. And then one day her granddaughter, Nora, the milliner, came in and asked her to try on one of her hats, a 1940s felt classic with a feather, and wear it as she once did a similar hat 60 years ago when Walter was still alive, and she did, taking her time to swing her legs like arms onto the floor and stand, then walk again, as if she could see just where to pose in the parlor and smile for the camera until she could smile no longer and walk back into her bright dark room and slept. We uh, have this little co-op down at Putney, Putney Co-op, right off 91. Probably a lot of you have gone there, gotten a latte off of 91, or carrots or apples or something. Uh, and Allen Ginsberg has this wonderful poem called At a Supermarket in California. I thought we should have one on the East Coast, <laughs> Putney Co-op, an opera. It has a little uh, epigraph. Um, by Allen Ginsberg here. We will stroll dreaming of the lost America of love past blue automobiles and driveways, home to our silent cottages. Allen Ginsberg. Go ahead, I say to my neighbor at the Putney Co-op, who tells me he can't complain. Let it out. It's mid-March, and there's still two feet of snow on the ground. Fukushima has just melted down, and the Washington Monument cracked at its pyramidion. Put down your bags and sing. How many times, dear father, graybeard, lonely old courage teacher, must you walk down the aisles as a randy Edelin humming your tunes for us to start? Our song begins in silence and grows to a buzz. We make it up as we go along, then watch our numbers swell. 10,000 members who have eyes to see and ears to hear. Why, who fly like a swarm to join us in our chambers, which are these aisles. I'm singing without knowing it, carrying the tune of main things, lamenting the prices with Bernie Sanders. My neighbor joins me for no other reason than singing along as a member of the cast we call the multitudes of lonely shoppers. I roam the aisles with the sadness of America, juggling onions, blessing the beats. It's a local stage on which the country opens like a flower and no one sees beside the road, that no one sees beside the road. In my hungry fatigue, I'm shopping for images which are free on the highest shelf, but costly in their absence. The only ingredient here that heals my sight of blindness. I see you, Walt Whitman, pointing your beard toward Axis Mundi by the avocados, reading the labels as if they were lines, weighing the tomatoes on the scale of your palms, pressing the pears with your thumbs the way you did in Huntington, Camden, Brook and Brooklyn. And you also, Ruth, and Hayden, and Galway, and Maxine at the checkout counter with empty bags you claim are full of apples, almonds, and bananas. What can you say to those outside who haven't read your poems, who find it hard to get the news from poetry, but die miserably every day for the lack of what is found there? It's night, the Connecticut slips by across Route 5. The moon is my egg and stars my salt. I score the music of the carrots, scallions, and corn and the frost of the freezer windows. The suff of traffic on 91 washes my ears with the sound of tires on Blue McAdam. The doors close in an hour. We'll both be lonely when we return on the long, dark roads to our silent houses. I touch, I touch your book and dream of our odyssey westward to a field in Oregon, Kansas, or California, where we plant our oars and die ironically, where we finish our journey as strangers in our native land. These are the lyrics to our song in the aisles, the buzz of the swarm with our queen at the center. What America did you have, old howler, when you scattered into the sky, then floated like a cloud as another form in the making outside of time? forgetful at last, and empty of all you sang. You got it? I got it. <laughs>
I was worried it was going to startle somebody. Well, how did you do around it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you got it. It was easy. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So should I read about Wilder? Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I, didn't, I thought I was lost forever. <laughs> Maybe for the better. Who knows? So, digging potatoes with my grandson Wilder. The smell of apples and turning leaves filled the sky with autumn scent that lingered longer now in mid-October. Time to dig them up, I said to Wilder, who'd been waiting since June to harvest them, then carry them up in a basket to his mom and dad to cook for dinner. But where are they, Grandpa, he asked. I can't see them. They're in the ground, I said. We have to dig at which he looked confused but ready to dig. We'll dig together, I said. Okay, okay, he said, and then reached down to feel the ground with a touch of fear, as if he needed to feel the soil first with his little hands like a druid priest laying his palms on the sacred hills. And then while watching me unearth a giant red that didn't bite, dug down himself and found not one but five beneath the stem that looked long dead though still attached to many more. Keep digging, I said. Oh, man, he yelled as he held one up in his dirty hand. So swag, Grandpa, so swag. <laughs> That's a true story. Yes, sir. So I think I think some of you are Sugars in, in here? I know one person is. A late sugar in season. Apparently a pretty good one this year. I used to uh, sugar a lot uh, when I worked at the Putney School for many years over spring break with students who decided to stay over and experience the hard work of sugaring. And the uh, talk that sometimes take, takes place in the, in the sugar house. At the, at the Socratic Sugar House. I said the steam is like a ghost in the sugar house, and you said that didn't mean anything to you since you didn't believe in ghosts. So I said, how about a cloud then? And you said, but it isn't a cloud either, it's steam. Why do you want to make it something it isn't? I was only imagining, I said, don't you ever imagine? What for? To see things, I see plenty, it's dangerous to see more than what's there. But if you don't, you don't see what's there. Like ghosts? Well, yeah, ghosts and other things. If I said to you that the steam is a ghost that haunts the house, what would you say? I'd say you're crazy. <laughs> what's real is here and every place else. I'm not saying it isn't, I think the same, but what about those things you can't see? You've lost me now. You'd better keep your mind on the pan. Too much thinking ruins the syrup. I'm looking back and ahead at the same time when I stare at the sap. My mind is the fire that boils the sap that turns to syrup. That sounds nice enough, but crazier still than what you said before about the ghosts and clouds. Now run, run that off before it burns. Do you think that someone who thought that steam was like nothing else in the world invented syrup? That's what I mean by looking back, wondering what someone saw in something that wasn't yet real, but hidden there. So when I look at the steam and see a ghost, I'm only dreaming, of course. I know it's steam, but I'm also saying there are things inside of things. The world's the way it is, always knowable in the end, always hard with evidence if you look close enough. I looked at something once and called it sugar by mistake. The little sweetness we get comes from so much work. Forty gallons of sap to one of syrup. You look at the steam and see a ghost. I look at the steam and see my grief. We're close enough in that, I guess. So let's leave it there. Either way, it comes to nothing in the air above the roof. So I, I commute to uh, Rhode Island about twice a week, refuse to live down there, where um, I sometimes get nasty old uh, 
notes on my car that tell me to go back to Vermont. <laughs> Especially when I park too close to someone else in front of me. Uh, but I've been down there for almost 20 years teaching, and uh, uh, Providence College has been very good to me. And so um, I uh, head down there every, every Monday, Tuesday, depends on the um, days, the week on my schedule. And sometimes I forget my wallet, so I have to stop in, uh, I have to stop sometimes in Northfield to go all the way back and get it, and, which is a great annoyance, but I've noticed that on my trip back to Putney, um, that I, I see the whole world anew. I, um, so I've, I've, this happens often enough, so that I, I, feel like, I feel that going back, returning to get something I forgot, it's like a ticket to see the world anew. So, return is ticket. When I'm forced to return home to retrieve something I've forgotten, I enter a double zone that's the same road I just went down, but am returning on now with an altered vision of its sameness that turns it into another road which is so different I hardly know what to call it as I speed forward and heading back taking in everything that's so familiar, the fence posts, pasture elms and burdock, as suddenly strange through the lens of inconvenience. It's almost a dream, but not really, more a consequence of accepting my mistake, which allows me in turn to see, if even briefly, so many things I've hidden as if my mind needed to forget to save my heart from the haste that governs my life. Something shines in the distance. I call it the lamp of internal difference that needs the spark of my seeing anew to light its mantle. Then everything I see I know was once forgotten and lay in the dark behind the light. I hear the cries of them all as parts of the whole and the suff of wheels in the absence of the single thing that I've forgotten and then the loss of those I can't redeem. They are songs as well as that quiet, the hum of a powerful engine and slap of tires on wet macadam. I notice too that the cobalt sky has now come, become the vault for all I feel on the road of my remembering. It is my ticket for the matinee of my own showing. This turning back to fetch my wallet, this foreign film I title Late Again with burning captions. I think I'll just read a few more short ones here. Um, we have a, we're lucky enough to have a few hermit thrush outside uh, in our woods, which of course you can't you never see. Has anyone seen a hermit thrush before? You can you have seen them. That's what you're lucky. I mean they're, they look just like an other bird. They do look like I, I know the pictures of them, so I know they exist. Um, but, uh, you know, they're so hard to see. And if you go out there in the woods to try and find them, you know, they're camouflage or they fly away. But that, that song is just magic. The, the state bird, of course, the hermit thrush. The hermit thrush is set for six to sing his song as if it were the end of the world. And he was stirred by dust to sing the same sweet song again and again in the understory, as if to say, it's neither words nor meaning that matters in the end, but the quality of sound, as if we were deafened by the sun and needed his song as a key to unlock our ears, to hear and hear and understand, to see and see, knowing that this one day is the end for now, which it is. It is, he claims, with a song just loud enough to pierce the woods until the night descends like a thousand veils, and then just one. So, <clears throat> about another bird, you know, birds fly against our windows all the time. Look dead for ages, and sometimes they are. Um, often sparrows, small black eye. 
The sparrow lay stunned but still alive in the periwinkle, a victim of the window that appears as air in the kingdom of birds. I picked her up and placed her wing against my face as she came around. All the world, sky, grass, trees, shone inside her small black eye that was perfectly still as it stared at me like a stone it could see. Thank you very much. And I wanted to take your picture. <laughs> uh, I'm the Poem City director, and this is Michelle Singer, the Poem City coordinator. And for years we've worked together. Uh, at first it was as a volunteer, um, and then as coordinator, because there are many things to do to organize uh, Poem City. And this year, one of the many things that Michelle did was to uh, place the poems with the venues. And we had over 500 poems to place at venues. Um, that's a lot of work. And she made a lot of the contacts uh, with presenters. Um, and so I, I wanted you to know who Michelle Singer is. I also would like to invite all of you to come out um, into the next room. We have food and drink, and perhaps get to know our Poets Laureate uh, a little bit more, and they also have books for sale. And uh, there are poems by the Poets Laureates, <laughs> Laureate, um, out in the other room, and I hope you take the time to read them. They are also in and around town. Uh, Marigold Adornment on East State Street has one poem, um, and Vermont League of Cities and Towns and the library also has poems uh, by Alice Stewart and Shard. And your readings were marvelous. Yeah. Yeah. It was really... Yeah. And I wanted the three uh, poet laureates from Northern New England to come here because I am a Northern New England person. Born in Maine, went to college and lived in New Hampshire, went to UNH, um, and now live in Vermont. And, and I, th so this was my dream, and, and thank you for making my dream come true. And, uh, please join us in the next room. And thank you, Kim, Kathleen, Thomas is up there. Um, for making it happen here. They're great hosts. <laughs>